Welcome everybody. We're out here in the field today doing a virtual walk around and a demo to kind of get you guys out in the field like like you were here with us is what we're hoping. We're out here in the field today with Klaus and we're going to do a walk around of the machine, talk about the setting points, going through the, the setup and operations and explaining the machine a little bit for you, and then we're going to run in the field. So our bifold mock tills have four hydraulic circuits. Trifolds like this narrow transport 30 you see in front of me have five. The first one, our green circuit, is our roller or our wheels. Our blue circuit is our rollers. Our orange circuit is our transport. And our uh, black is our wings. Also gray for our hydraulic jack. So the first thing that we need to do is tip it backwards and get basically out of the cradles, which would be our third circuit, which I'll have Greg go for us right now. So we've got it up and out of the cradles, and we're gonna go to four, which is our wings, which is our unfold. So then as our wings come around, we get the machine where it's vertical like you see here. Then we're going back to three, which is lowering that machine down. And once we get this all the way over, these two transport circuits right here will then go into float. So now we've got our transports in the float. So these two cylinders here gives us our front to back contrability. Now we turn our four on to constant to set our weight transfer system. There is a gauge on the other side of the light bar over here on the left hand side of the machine where you can read the gauge. But what that does is it gives us downforce or it takes some of that weight, very similar like we do on our planters. It's just a weight distribution system. So we're taking some of that center weight, extending it to the wings. Even though uh, we have maybe areas that we need to contour, that's fine. We can say we're climbing up on a terrace. That wing will break away once it hits that pressure. Size like this machine, as you're gonna see about 11, 1,000 to 1,100 PSI out to the wings. Once we get over that point, it's gonna release and let that machine float through, then come back. So our number one circuit here is on our front wheels. So lower one. So you can see now the front is lowered. And our back or the roller circuit is number two. So take two and go down. So as you can see, this machine is kind of like an A-frame. As it comes up or down, we're suspending this middle section right here. So as we're out in the field, the rollers come in, the wheels come in, and we're raising that up out of the ground. That also, as you can see, is what sets our depth. And we'll talk about our depth here after a little bit. So if we raise one and two up, this is your turnaround position. Um, there's several different ways to do this. You can leave the wheels down and lift the rollers or uh, leave the rollers down and lift the wheels, or you can do them both. Um, it's kind of operator dependent or how they want to do it, but this is your turnaround position at this point. So as we talked about earlier, our hydraulic layout, um, oversized Kinefix couplers, so we give something to grip a hold of. Standard on the mock till, we've got the, the color-coded hydraulic circuits as we talked about during the hookup procedure. Something else to mention is our articulating hitch comes standard across all models of mock till. So that keeps us the, the draw bar tight and the hitch pin tight so we're not seeing excessive draw bar and hitch pin wear. So we work down to our large oversized hydraulic jack, that large footprint. No matter where you unhook it at, we've got that large footprint so you're not worried about sinking it in your machine shed or out in the yard if you need to unhook it and hook to a grain cart or whatnot. As we work down the frame here, something that we've changed that came out last February at the National Farm Machinery Show was our narrow transport large frames, or our triplex frames as I call them. So this is a 30 foot mock till. We've got our 30 and our 36 foot at a 13 feet, two inch transport. So we've narrowed it down from 20, as you've seen in our larger uh, 33 foot and our 40 foot machines. We've narrowed that down to 13 feet, two inches. Now on our 41 foot, it's a little bit wider. We've got a little bit more frame, a little bit longer wings, but we're still 16 feet transport width. But what we've changed is our 
center frame section here, we've pulled our tires inboard a long way. So very similar, like if you're taking a large soil finisher out to the field, you can swing the machine out in the ditch a little bit to clear, or if you've got somebody coming up against you in the road, but we're not worried about having those tires go off with it. Uh, so they've sucked inboard. We've got our, our narrow transport center, and now we go up to the wings. All right, so getting into some of the maintenance components or the long wear items, uh, really the only greasable points on the mock till is our transport hubs across the front. They're like a 50 hour service. And then our articulating hitch up in the front is like every day um, just to keep the grease out or the dirt out of the ball. But really that's the rest of the maintainable points in this machine. You'll see we use large nickel plated pins and composite bushings, not only on our cylinder points, but also on the frame points, like you can see down here on the frame. And we'll show you some more of those, but really that's the only maintenance that needs to be done to these machines. Uh, as we talk about our hydraulic system, so our master and slave system have these shims. So our depth stops are controlled by these shims. Each one of these shims is a half inch of travel, plus or minus. So we put one in, we're gaining a half inch. Uh, we take one out, we're losing a half inch. So. That's what controls that. So we've changed on our narrow transports, we've changed these positions to be a more ergonomic position, all four corners of this machine. So you get out of the cab, you walk around, you get back in and you don't have to climb on the machine anymore. It's set right in front of you. Now, as we start working into our blades, so our front row, front row of blades, as you guys can see, each one of these are independently torsioned long life torsion devices. Guys, we're seeing over 100,000 acres on these torsion devices, but that's what holds that arm and blade in position. So our front row takes, picks and passes that soil backwards and to the right. These blades here are attached to that arm with a large sealed bearing. So once again, a no maintenance feature. These bearings are lasting 20,000 plus acres in most conditions. Blades vary depending on soil. So if you're in a really abrasive condition, um, we take it down and test blades out where we, we send blades to die, basically. We're still seeing over 5,000 acres on those. I've heard reports up near 15,000 acres on guys before they've needed to reblade. So really depends on your soil. So as you notice our, our front blades, we talked about those. Now we're getting towards the backside. So the front has moved all the soil off to the right. Now we're returning that with this cover board. So we're taking, catching anything from the front. We're taking off any of those peaks on the front row and it returns it back to the left hand side of the machine. With this, as you guys will notice, our arms have compound angles. So the front and the back are a little bit different. Front does our chopping and mixing action, or chopping action, excuse me. And then on the back does that, uh, continuing that cross cut and then an inversion. So that's where we get that great land leveling, uh, that great incorporation is uh, built into it. So we've returned it with our cover board here on the outside. Our back's filled in any valleys. And then as we work back towards our roller, that's what does our consolidation. But we'll talk more about the roller here. We look at the back lift circuit. So our master, once again, on the corner, we have very ergonomic position to change these depth stops. And then as we work around the back, we'll talk about the roller and the scraper system. So talking about the cover a little bit, or I call it the, the cover board, uh, we're catching that soil in the front side, return it down to the back. A lot of people ask on the settings on this. So we have a fore and aft or an in and out um, right here. It's like a hitch pin and a receiver for a truck. We can slide this out so the drier the soil is and the less residue, the further out we're going to need to move this. The wetter it is and the heavier the residue, the closer it needs to be to stay that blade. And you can gauge it based off your finish passes and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. The next thing would be is our board. I like to tip the front up and have the rear fingers just barely grazing the ground. We're running a little deep, so you'll notice I've moved it up in the slot, uh, so we're not dragging on the ground. The next thing would be is, guys, if we're out and going off at an angle in our soil, we look for like a 20 degree angle, especially like out here in the corn stalks. If you go right with the row, this thing could start grabbing those stalks like an arm. So another reason we wanna go off at a diagonal, just so we're filling in the, the furrows and we're not catching a bunch of fodder. As we get towards the back of the machine, you guys, our Autoco furrow roller here, you'll notice that there is a hub and bearing on each side. It is a pure tillage extreme bearing. If you watch these machines on the field, they're back here. I call it the dishwasher from hell. I don't know any other way to say that, but they're constantly being pelleted with silt, soils, uh, rocks, stubble, chaff, 
um, and they're sealed off. So we're seeing upwards of 15,000 acres on these guys. The nice thing about these though, we did have a customer that had a bearing go bad and got into a shaft a little bit. Well, the nice thing about this is you're not ruining this whole assembly. That's a stub shaft you can pull out, put a new one back in, you're good to go. You're not replacing this whole roller assembly. Um, as we work into the rollers, we got a lot of people that ask questions about that. I'll get into the agronomic piece of it here in a little bit, but just from the, the lifespan or the longevity aspect of it, we're seeing 100,000 plus acres out of these. So, you know, more or less the lifespan of the machine or um, sticks with it. Um, they're individual sections. Each one of these are pressed onto a tube. Uh, we do have uh, replacement parts. We do have some guys, say for example, hit like a, a fence post on the end and chipped it up a little bit. You can take this roller out, pop that end one off and put it in um, if you want to. Uh, so there are replacement parts available for it, but really guys, we're not seeing much use out of those. As we work down to the scraper, so this is a tungsten carbon hardened face on the bottom of this. These arms are, are inside the valley or the micro valley of this uh, roller. So what that's doing is as that roller is coming around, it's shedding off any soil uh, and returning it back to the ground as this thing's rolling around. And here in a minute, we'll talk about the agronomic piece of it. So the deflector there in the center is one thing that we forget to mention or talk about very often. So during our fall pass, uh, as you can see, that's raised up or there's some of that black check chunk uh, sticking above that blue bracket. Uh, we want that in the raised position in corn stalks or any of that high fodder content uh, to allow that trash to flow through. As we get into the spring side or the soil finishing side of things, we can lower that down and it uses that, that deflector. So what it does is it kicks the soil both directions to the furrow rollers. We get asked a lot, why the rubber roller? And guys, we've tested the, the bar baskets, the springtime arrows, um, several other different types, but honestly, the rubber roller has outperformed them agronomically as well as what it does to the machine. So say for example, we're out in a stony field, we hit a rock. Well, with this rubber, it gives us kind of a shock absorber as well. With a bar basket or a steel roller, you're transmitting that shock load A through the roller, up into the bearings, then through the frame. So if you look at a lot of competitive units, look how their back frames are reinforced and gusseted because they're transmitting that shock load up through that whole frame. As we're going through the field, guys, think about how these frames are built. Look at how the points are made. Uh, there's a lot of forces that are exuded when you're going 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 miles an hour in the field. So you want a frame that's robust that will withstand those acres and still have a resale value on the backside. So talking a little more about the, the agronomic side, as you guys see here, we've got a raise and a lower. It kind of looks more or less like a colda packer. Well, you get that same type of finish on the end of the soil. So in the micro peak and the micro valley of that soil that's left over, you get places for water to inf infiltrate. So that valley allows that capillary action, the soil to start pulling it down, getting into the soil so we're not hitting the water. Um, you know, we're pretty dry here in Iowa right now, but allowing that water to infiltrate instead of run off. On the peak or the ridge part of it, gives us a place for air to exchange or gases to exchange. So carbon dioxide and oxygen, allowing that soil to continue to respirate. Uh, we're, we're letting that, those microbes live longer into the winter time as we're chopping up this residue, giving them a food source, letting them eat that up. Uh, so we're getting our carbon nitrogen cycle back into balance before we come back around the next spring. As we look at these rollers, we're talking, you know, every inch of this, the work surface is going to be touched. What that does is set the soil profile density equal, allowing it to, so say we're in a, a, a warming and uh, drying period or a wetting and cooling period, we're equal across every acre. So think of like a chisel plow, for example. You've got a shank here and a shank here. The density where the shank is or beside the shank is going to be totally different, right? It's going to be loose where that shank has gone through, not so loose where it hasn't. Well, same thing happens with a lot of those, those finishing apparatuses. We've got a bar that hits here, and then here we've got an 8-inch gap in between that. Well, the soil density is going to change as well. We want that to be equalized across. So whether we come around spring and we're looking to warm it up and dry it out a little bit, or if we're going in the fall, you know, we're getting into a, a wetting and cooling period. Everything's going to be equalized. That's what we're looking for across every acre of our field. So as we get out in the field, get ready to run, here's a, just a few pre-step items to look at. Make sure our number three are our transport circuits in full float. As we talked about earlier, that gives us that front to back contrability. Wing circuits, 
need to be in that full extension. We can turn the flow down, guys. It doesn't take a whole lot of flow to activate that weight transfer system. You know, maybe start at half flow. Uh, basically, as we're unfolding this machine, would be a good point to set that just so we don't slow down the fold sequence too much. But that's really all the oil it takes to run that. So making sure that we're full extend and we check our gauge back there. It says, you know, that 1,100 PSI. And then the next thing to do is setting our depths at our four corners. How deep do we want to go? Well, today we're in some corn stock residue. The ground's really, really hard. Uh, want to get underneath that, shatter that root ball out. Um, we're not really just popping the root ball, you're actually kind of forcing it because the ground's kind of concrete. So we're going to go in a little deep today. Um, I start off setting the dimensions front and back equal. So that should be, our blade should be equal. Once we get running in the field, we'll check that. We can adjust front or back individually, or we can take them down or up a full notch with all four corners. Sometimes when running though, our front, especially with our double V notch blades, is the most aggressive point of this machine. Sometimes you'll have seven and seven, say for example, and you'll notice that the front's running a little deeper. Not uncommon to need to take out another shim in the back or maybe add a shim to the front just so our blades are equal. That's what we really want to strive for to get that full shearing effect. Um, also, it helps with our trailing of the machine. So if you guys see the machine doglegging one direction or another, you're basically in a battle between the front and back blades. So if the back, say the machine's doglegged off to the right, I would check my transport cylinder to make sure that it's in float and we're not fully extended, putting all the weight on the back. If it's doglegging to the left, I would check my front blades, make sure that we're not nose dived in. And honestly, when we hit that nose dive approach, you're gonna have the worst finish uh, settings and the machine is the most unstable when we go that route. So especially springtime guys, make sure that we're equal uh, front to back. 